Welcome to Dial the Gate, the Stargate Oral History Project. My name is David Reed. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode. John Gadetsky, Visual Effects Supervisor for Stargate SG-1 in Atlantis, is back. And he's got some Atlantis streets to show you, having to do with mostly with uh, the pilot uh, for Stargate Atlantis, Rising. And uh, I just... I, I the stuff that we are going to show you is going to blow your mind. So a lot of animatics, a lot of behind the scenes footage. So he's been really good about uh, sharing this uh, this content with us. But before I bring him in, if you enjoy Stargate and you want to see more content like this available on YouTube, please click that like button. It makes a difference with YouTube and will continue to help the show grow its audience. And please also consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend. And if you want to get notified about future episodes, click the subscribe icon and giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops and you'll get my last excuse me you'll get my notifications of any last minute guest changes and clips from this uh, stream will be released over the course of the next uh, few weeks on both the dial the gate and gateworld.net youtube channels this is a pre-recorded show because john had a lot of assets to show us and i wanted to make sure that we got the maximum quality available so um you're not gonna be able to ask him questions because this is from your perspective, all in the past. So uh, the moderators will just be hanging out with you to uh, enjoy the show with you. We'll have John back uh, later on, probably back in season four, to do another direct Q&A. Um, but for this episode, this is much of a, a show and tell. So let's go ahead and bring him in. John Gadetsky, Visual Effects Supervisor, Stargate SG-1, Stargate Atlantis, sir. Welcome back. I am I am thrilled to have you back. We had I had such a good time last time you were around. It was just like a matter of time. Okay, we got to get this guy on the show because he's just way too much fun. So so thank you for being here. Um, yeah. Sorry it took us so long to get back together. No, it's all good. The WGA strike is evidently uh, resolving. SAG is another story. How is work for you right now? Do you have any, any updates on your front in terms of the movement of stuff, in terms of how this has continued to affect your world? Um, I'm really interested uh, in your perspective on this. Well, we uh, screaming nightmare was the uh, term that came to mind. Uh, you know, this isn't my first strike. We, I, I've been doing this for a while. And uh, every 10 years or so, the industry absolutely shits itself. Yeah. And this is this is just one of those many many events uh it was a problem because the writers and the and the actors went at the same time other years it was the directors sometimes they didn't even need to strike just the threat of the strike back uh you know 20, 10 and 20 years ago threw the industry into such a tizzy that everybody started uh, stockpiling product so even if there was no strike it was still slow afterwards. And of course, uh, one of the strikes led to reality TV, yeah, which uh, was uh, an unexpected consequence that I think everybody came to regret, except for, I don't know, my wife and your wife and everybody's families who watched the stuff. But uh, no, the writer's strike, the actor's strike was a problem for us. It shut down most of North American production. So last year I was on Superman and Lois. The show came to an end and it, it, there's no word whether it's coming back. I'm sure it's coming back, but, uh, you know, some shows are just gone. What happened to me uh, personally was we had, uh, you know, there was just a complete, the work just vanished for a while. And that was great because I had finished, again, I would finished Superman and Lois. It was an intense year we uh the family and i we rented a house uh to kind of take the summer off we were going to visit london and paris this summer but instead we went to this little town of point roberts because it was way less expensive you just have to start thinking in a completely different way sure. uh we did uh work on an apple show uh a show called bad monkey which will be coming out we uh Normally, we don't do cleanups. They had a lot of cleanups. The producers, you know, I, I'd known them from a long time ago. We worked on a bunch of MGM shows, actually. So uh, Stargate and Atlantis and Outer Limits, uh, they all came back to save me again because <laughs> some of those producers were on this show. And uh, so, you know, we did uh, three episodes uh, in total, just and it kept a couple of the artists busy. Uh, we were working on a, a feature, a, a First Nations feature right now. 
So uh, normally they wouldn't be able to do this amount of visual effects work, but they caught us at a good time. <laughs> so, uh, you know, my crew uh, and I were like, well, we can give these guys a deal and do something fun. And that's what we're doing. So they're getting uh, more shots. We we think it's going really well. And uh, I'm keeping my artists busy, which for me is really the most important thing, keeping that team busy. So when the industry comes back full force, they haven't scattered or, or gone to other companies. That's and things. correct. And that's on everybody's mind because so many companies have had to let so many people go that uh, we, we know with the strikes ending, there's probably going to be a boom. Can we get our people back? And, it, you know, because just that same team, there's that chemistry that builds up over years that you don't want to start building up again. Right. No, absolutely. If, if, if you've got the talent, um, you want to make sure that you can keep the talent. But, I mean, they've got to feed their families, <laughs> you know? Oh, so dude. it's like you can't blame them for going out and finding work. And if they happen to fall in love with wherever they are, you know, right. in terms of, like, scheduling or in terms of, like, the amount of hours that are put in or what have you, what can you do? There's, not, there's only so much you can do. You have to start from square one. The visual effects industry is is famous justly and unjustly for the crazy work hours. Uh, and I know that it's been a problem worldwide, uh, basically since it started. And uh, in part because uh, expectations are really high, in part because sometimes you can't make people stop working, and in part because, you know, production puts so much pressure on you to do this outstanding work, and you're afraid that if we don't do it, you know, someone else is going to do it. Yep. So uh, there's all kinds of reasons why we work the hours that we do. Yeah. Uh, of course, now we're at the opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, right. Don't yeah. really remember where I was going with Feast that. Feast or famine? Did uh, were you aware of the film Sausage Party? Yes. <laughs> so you heard about the uh, the practical slave conditions that uh, some of those uh, visual effects guys were under. I I heard just it was like it was I did one of the not, worst. I believe it. A friend of mine had a company that they called Digital Slaves, <laughs> and uh, oh, they man. basically. Every shot, now this was maybe 15, 20 years ago. Every shot was $1,000, didn't matter what it was. So from a producer's point of view, you go there, you know you're getting people who are just out of school, and uh, off you go. Uh, no, we, you know, it's funny because uh, I found that giving people better working conditions is, is more successful than uh, taking advantage of them. But, you know, sometimes there was a, a movie we did a long time ago where I ended up working six days straight. Like, I, I didn't go home for six days. Uh, and the overtime that we paid was astronomical. But that's what it took to get it done. Uh, I suspect when the industry kicks off again, there's going to be that kind of pressure again to work these hours to hit these deadlines for shows that are way behind schedule. But I don't, I, I think there's a, a much greater awareness now that, uh, you know, that's not good for people. It's not, uh, what's the word legal. So, <laughs> so, you know, there's been, uh, and in, in fact, on Superman and Lois, the show that we just did, there was incredible efforts where, and always successful. We're not doing overtime. You need permission to do overtime. You're not allowed to work the weekend. Like, you just can't do that without permission. And any work that you do, we're going to, you know, obviously you get paid for that time. Track your hours. We want to make sure everyone's taken care of. But we found the way to attract people now is, well, so I tend to find people on their way to Star Wars and on their way back from Star Wars. That's kind of how I phrase it. No, Star Wars is really just a metaphor. But all these people who are starting out, I look for the really talented artists, the ones who are just out of school, those people who just you know have it, but haven't been discovered by the big companies. So we look for those people because you know I can pay them to do overtime on the weekend, and they're still cheaper than my lead artists who we you know keep to forty hours. So. 
you know, we find these people, we nurture them, they might work with me for three years, five years, six years, and then, you know, they go off to ILM, they go off to DD, they work on these really big movies, where we know uh, the hours can be extremely long. And they do that for five years, 10 years, whatever. And then I catch them on their way back where, well, now we have lots of experience. Now I have lots of talent and a track record. And I have a family. I don't want to work weekends. I don't want to work nights. And I'm like, absolutely. This is how we're going to structure, you know, your deal. So we've got the, you know, the young people starting out and we've got the really experienced people coming back. And that's sort of how I structure my teams. Okay. Because there are two different points in their life with two different sets of life needs and two different sets of life experiences, which Correct. weave into the work. Correct. So, you know, you use them in different ways. Wow. And uh, you know what? If people are happy, they do good work. Yeah. And that's all it is. With the advances in the technology and the, uh, the internal politics of the studios and and everything that you deal with as it is are things getting uh or going to get better in your mind or worse because you know uh, you can you can produce far more content far more amazing visuals far faster than you ever did before but is the workload keeping up with that to uh, so is it scaling together or are you finding it uh, to be uh, untenable uh, long term? No, I, I'm good question. Uh, the arc of history bends towards justice. It does, MLK, absolutely. <laughs> well, okay, it used to. <laughs> and and used I to. believe it will again. And I'm not talking about the visual effects industry uh, there. Uh, no. There's been a, a long-term push to making the industry more sustainable, and that's going to continue. It, it has to continue. Uh, in part, that's part of the Western experience that, you know, we do pay people fairly and we do take care of people as, you know, and we build systems and we put systems in place that do that. Uh especially with the big U.S. shows that I work on, there's a lot of effort that's put into making sure, like, there's no appetite for taking advantage of people. It's just not there. There's no upscale to them to do this. So, you know, because uh, of, you know, a whole bunch of reasons. You know, A, it's the right thing to do, but, you know, B, you can get bad PR, which we've seen. And, and you know, quite frankly, when people are taken advantage of, they often don't do great work in the long run. So, you know, we know as a society that uh, taking care of people is the right way to go, making sure that they're paid for all of their hours, because that's one thing that comes up a lot, making sure that they're not working ridiculous hours, making sure that there's time off. Uh, that leads to quality uh, on the screen. Sometimes, but, but to get the other thing that leads to quality is time. And that's where streaming shows really have the network shows be. Uh, because they will say, well, we're going to spend a year doing this show. So when I was working on Project Blue Book, there's a picture from it back there. Absolutely. One of my favorite shows of all time to work on uh, with A&E. You know, we had a year. We had X amount of money to work on this show. It was 10 episodes. We could really make sure that everything looked great because, you know, you'd work on something and you go, mm, you know, it's just I'm going to put that away, work on something else. I'll come back to that on Monday. And then we look at it again and go, oh, well, clearly that's the problem. Something that you don't see when you're buried in it. <clears throat> and uh, sometimes on network shows, when the deadlines are so tight, you're just going, 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 and you don't have that time to reflect. Wow. Okay. So when we did, again, when we did Superman last year, we tried uh, to leapfrog episodes with teams. So uh, this team is working on the forest fire scene from episode uh, six, and they're not going to work on episode five, and they're not going to work on episode seven, and maybe not even eight, like so that we could set small uh, task forces, small tiger teams, whatever you want to call it, uh, 
and give them a chunk and absolutely do your best not to bug them when the shit is hitting the fan on some other episode. You've got to resist the, oh, can everybody jump on this for a few minutes? And of course, sometimes you do. But, you know, there's ways of structuring projects. It's interesting the conversation we're having because uh, in light of the Ukraine war, something you hear a lot is, uh, you know, professionals talk about logistics where amateurs talk about strategy. Oh, why didn't they attack here? Why didn't, didn't, you know, why didn't they do that? You know, my daughter makes fun of me when I watch World War II documentaries. She's like, is every dad on earth studying for some exam that that's coming up that we don't know about? So, my, yeah, father, you know. my father can be <laughs> the exact same example can can uh, can apply to him in That's terms right. of that. It's I'm like, this is, what are you can studying be- for? You know, where is this all this ab- absorption? What, what is this coming to fruition to? <laughs> it's really funny because, uh, you know, I can't help it. I'm a big fan of the logistics behind D-Day, for instance. That's kind of one of my things. Yeah. But uh the professionals talk about logistics, and that's really, in a lot of ways, what visual effects is. That's certainly what filmmaking is. It's how are we going to schedule it to get the most out of our people? How are we going to schedule their hours to get the best performance? When are we going to shoot things so that we have time to test? The art, I find, happens very quickly at the very beginning. You know, we talk about the show. I know what it's going to look like. We've... Okay, and, and then I spend the rest of the year living up to what I promised, you know, all those months ago through the medium of money and people and time. And uh, I really like doing that. That's actually one of my favorite things is not just, you know, oh, let's make the Stargate a little brighter. It's OK, we're going to, you know, I don't tell people what to do. In a lot of ways, I tell people what order to do it in. You know, you need to work on the gate because they need it to do this. And we need this. So once everyone knows that, the system actually works fairly smoothly. And I remember many times uh, being out with my friends and and they're like, aren't you delivering this week? I said, yeah, everything's going great. Because if you organize the shit out of it at the beginning, aside from the, the, the crazy uh, unexpected things that guarantee it's going to happen, you're more or less going to have a smooth delivery. So begin with the end in mind. There you go. It's yeah. an axiom that I live by. The yeah. things that you don't anticipate. Um, <laughs> cleanup shots. Um, I had an interesting yeah, but conversation. But you always know there's going to be some of them. Oh, so you antici- you build that in with into the equation. Uh, God, some producers hate that, right? I'll put in like, you know, $20,000. I've got $20,000 for cleanup. They're like, what's this? Well, I don't know. I don't know what's going to need cleanup, but I know there's going to be some. And some producers are like, yep, okay. And others are like, no, take it out because we want to approve it later. It's like, sure, absolutely, good idea, whatever you want. Yeah, yes or yes, but John, That's right. <laughs> I, I had, I had a conversation with Bruce Woloshin. Well, there you go. That's 20, why these cliches are all familiar to me, right? Uh, about uh, twenty years ago now, and you know, I, I, I had a mindset of. Well, you know, whatever you money is pumped at you, it ends up, you know, on the screen in a spectacular way. And he said, no, no, it's, it's not true. Uh, a lot of of their work was rig removal where there were cables and shots and they had to digitally erase them. He said, that's hard. And if you do it oh, right, yeah. no one will ever know that you touched it. Yeah. And, you know, I have to wonder how often that comes into the equation for you guys, where it's like there are shots here that we've we've got to take these elements out you know this it can't it can't exist and if there are moving elements behind it oh my god you know and you have you have you have no point of reference like how do you just not want to just bash your head into a wall sometimes well sometimes sometimes questionable decisions are made for honorable reasons yeah you know uh there was this project i was on there's going to be a lot of water so they got these plastic green screens and they put them all up and we shot on these plastic green screens and they looked, they didn't look as good as fabric ones, <clears throat> except if they got wet, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> then the plastic green screens would have looked better <clears throat> than the fabric ones. Turns out they really didn't get wet. So we had these wrinkly green screens, which means they're not really green screens, which means 
an enormous amount of work went out for Roto. And we know why we made the decision. We expected there to be more water. There wasn't, but now we were going down the Roto route anyway. So <clears throat> probably 10% of that episode's budget just went to Roto. Oh Not only that, but there's the time involved. It was a huge episode. So I had to hire a Roto producer just to come in. I, I mean, that's a crazy title, Roto producer. But, you know, that was essentially what they did. Their job was make sure that every piece of Roto got packaged up, sent to a vendor, bid. Did they get the full res plates? Have this, you know, have they come back? Have they been checked? That whole process has to happen before the artists really get into their shots too far. It was a full-time job for about six weeks for one person. So you're talking about yeah. rotoscoping. Just managing, sending the roto out to companies that would do it. Because the way I, I structure my teams, my teams do the art. We find, you know, we don't, <clears throat> it's not worth me working on cleanup. It's not what I'm hired for. It's not what I'm good at. Uh, so we send that out to, uh, there's great companies in India. There's great companies all over the world now. Uh, they do a fantastic job. The price is good. You know, they, they're they not eligible for tax credits, which is a part of the movie making equation. But, you know, you run the numbers and you say, these guys are going to do it. They're going to do it in time. We're not going to do it in time. This is the solution. And, you know, now, of course, we use them for bigger things because they've grown up and they Correct. have more experience. And that's worked out. But uh, honest to God, full-time job for six weeks, just managing the roto. But yeah, what Bruce is saying is true. Uh, uh, the Bad Monkey Project was essentially all cleanup. Uh, the character wore sunglasses. It was just part of the character. Well, now there's a camera crew reflected in the sunglasses. There's nothing you can do about that except shoot a clean plate and know that visual effects is going to deal with it later. Wow. Wow. And, you know, that's the character. That's what they want. That's what they can have. It's a process. And of course, you're right. The audience will never see it. They'll just look at that and go, oh, look, it's my favorite actor, so-and-so. Right. Exactly. Now, it's I, I, you look at a number of uh, of old films and television shows, you got a number of them wearing sunglasses. You see, you, 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 you see the behind yeah. the scenes people. You see the light rigs. Um, is it just because we're in such high resolution now that they care more or it because we have the bandwidth to care more because the visual effects are, are sophisticated enough to to go in there and really, you know, scoop them out and replace the plate on these uh, on these uh, lenses that people are wearing? You know, that's a really good question, because <clears throat> when you watch Jurassic Park. Yep. There's rain on the windshield. There's not rain on the windshield. Here comes the T-Rex. There's rain on the windshield again. Nobody cares. Yeah. But now, of course, somebody's going to see it in editorial and they're going to say, oh, oh, your enterprise is glowing. The green light. <clears throat> yep. That's yep. hilarious. <laughs> yeah, Sorry, it's, the, it's, little, it's, it's the starboard uh, uh, anti collision pylon. So. That's right. <laughs> exactly what it is. Um, <laughs> Squirrel, John. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, me and my dog. It's it's a weird thing that some of the stuff we fix, like I get it. Mm -hmm. I get it. It's it's one step towards perfection. But I I tend to focus more on the art than the technical stuff. Mm. And what I found what I found on different projects is when I start getting technical notes, in other words, I submit a shot for review and I get a, a, a note and this is honest to God, a, a note we got. It's like, there's micro blocking in the highlight compression. Oh, for heaven's sake. Yes. Uh, <sighs> and I'm like, mm, for heaven's sake, those are the exact words that I used. <laughs> and and so, so you have to resist getting angry. And what I found over the years is the reason they're saying that is there's something wrong with the shot, but they don't know what to say that's not a mental process that they're going through. They're not aware of it. They're just, there's something wrong with, oh, look, there's micro blocking. If we clean up the compression, the shot will look good. No, if we make it lighter or darker, that might get what you want. Maybe we want more contrast, you know, artistic things. 
So whenever I start getting our uh, technical notes, I'm very aware that the client doesn't like the shot, but they're not, but they can't say what it is. And that the, those are really the, some of the most difficult things because, you know, your job of course is to deliver what's in their mind. <laughs> and uh, the reason you work with certain people is because you're good at divining that, you know, like on Stargate and Atlantis, I like working with Brad, Brad like working with me because I, over the years and I, uh, probably from the get go, his aesthetic is similar to my aesthetic. Oh, you want it like this, this, and this. In fact, I, Oh, I have a picture right here. Brad Wright, Robert Cooper, Bruce Woloshin. <laughs> Back to where we were a minute ago. Absolutely. And uh, that's us looking at, uh, clearly by the smiles, some of our successful shots on Atlantis. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But yeah, it's when I start getting those technical notes, that's when I realize something's up, nobody knows what's wrong, and I'm going to have to dig into this. Have you ever uh, ignored a note? It's like, oh, okay, yeah. they're they're venting. You know, I know these guys. I've been working with them for a while now. All right, we're just going to file this under their venting. Uh, oh, there's me and Robert. Uh, Probably after I parked in his parking spot. <laughs> yeah, he came upstairs one day. It's like some assholes in my parking spot, and like I get it because there's not a lot of parking spots, and I didn't think it was <laughs> pulled in really quickly. Ran upstairs. It's like ah, oh, busted. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah. Do we ignore notes? Uh, we try not to, of course. Of course. Uh, because there's always a reason for the notes. Sometimes I will try and talk people out of the notes because sometimes, you know, we're going down a certain creative path and they'll say, well, Hey, let's change this from red to blue. And in your head, you're going, this impacts 25 shots. Yep. Are you sure you want to do that? And let me tell you why. Yep. And I found that that's a really successful way to approach it is, you know, do we want to do it? Let me tell you why. And, and then if you need to, of course, we'll do it. But, you know, these are the consequences. Uh, Makes sense. Because, as you said a few minutes ago, the only two right answers in the film business is yes and yes, but. Yep. You can have anything you want. But. It's going to cost you. It's going to deliver late. Uh, it's going to impact all of these other shots down the road. One gentleman, uh, Jeff Kleiser, who worked with us on uh, Slither many years ago, he uh, he had this thing he called the Velcro dog. That was what they called it. So he would put something into a shot so the producer see it and ask him to remove it. So it's a Velcro, and it's the dog. It's there deliberately to be removed so that they get to have some input on a shot oh my gosh and uh <clears throat> so that's a secret uh sure i just told a million people uh but that's sort of what we came to call it it's like oh what a great name no absolutely because there are we have all been in situations where we have worked with someone or we have uh, dealt with someone who they may not be intending it as such, but from our perspective, it's very much, it's very much, okay, what you just did is solely from my point of view to justify your own employment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, because there, there are some people who are uncomfortable with saying, I have no uh, feedback on this X, Y, or Z, you know, <laughs> and you have to throw that, you know, that Velcro dog at them so that they can say, okay, yes, that. Now, the flip side of that is, what do you do if they didn't catch it? Well, I'll just go ahead and take that out. <laughs> so, yeah, oh, I well, like that Velcro dog. <laughs> well, yes, there's a 5%, 10% chance that you're going to absolutely screw yourself that way. Uh, what I do in those cases is I'll, I'll say, hey, there's this thing we were thinking of fixing it. I, we've probably already fixed it. We took this thing out. And uh, <clears throat> what do you think of that? And they're going, oh, yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> That's funny, what John. Saying, what you are saying a minute ago. Uh, there's another way of looking at it, and that is, it's not that they have nothing to add, but the way the industry is structured is producers who are on their way up can often only say no. In other words, they don't have the authority yet, 
to approve something. Mm -hmm. But you have to go through them to get to the people who approve things. Mm -hmm. So you get to this uh, one person and they're like, nope, I don't like this. Okay, let me try. Nope, I don't like that. And then when they're done saying no, I can show it to the showrunners. And by that point, the shot is sometimes no longer what was originally discussed. So what I do to deal with that, because it's a very real thing, is I'll say in one of the very first meetings, I'll, you know, we're talking about the budget, we're talking about what we're going to cost, this is what we estimate it's going to be, we've included all of the rig removal and cleanup allowances and everything, and I'll, and what I say, and it works so well, I say, for every person in the approval chain, increase the budget by 5%. Yeah. And the you see the whole room just come to a halt. And they're like, yeah. And then they talk and so-and-so is in charge. Yep. It's politics. But it only works. You have to play the game. Yes. And it only works if you do it right at the beginning. Okay. Yeah. Good. Well, right. you're establishing you expectations. That's right. That's right. It's... As you're aware, it's all politics. Yeah. The art happens pretty quickly. It's logistics and politics. And if you're working with people that you like, that's when these shows are fun. Absolutely. You know, that's when these shows are fun. And if you get in a group where it's like, oh, I am not enjoying this, it's mostly because someone's trying to figure out if they get you coffee or you get them coffee. Oh, my God. <laughs> It's like, no, you give me coffee. That's the way it is. <laughs> oh, man. Except I've never had a coffee. <laughs> Richard Tudolan and I had a similar conversation a few months ago. It's like, I, as long as the work gets done, I'll go get you the coffee. I don't care. You know, it's that's the right. work getting yeah. done. So, geez, that's funny. What do you uh, What do you have to show for us? I'm I'm curious to see what you've uh, what you've dug around and found. Well, yeah, you know, after we did the Stargate thing, I was digging around. I was doing a seminar at one of the local schools when it's not busy. I like to go to the schools and talk to the students because I can tell them things about the business and, you know, it keeps me busy, but it's also, you know, good for them. So I, I found some Atlanta stuff, not a lot, but a bit. Okay. And I thought I would show it to you. So here, let me show you first, just some of the pictures. Cause they're kind of fun to look at. This is one of the original um, concepts this, for the city. This was the first concept art wow. for the city of Atlantis. Is this uh, James Robbins? Uh, it would have come from the art department. I don't know who. It's not signed. Uh, okay. Basically, they said, we took a plate, we put some buildings on it. Yeah. We knew that you're on the show and you're going to, you know, you're going to take it and you're going to run with it. So good luck with that. It was a stand in piece. They they never intended the city to look like this. This was just an early, early concept art. I can see some of the slanted, some of the smaller slanted buildings, though. Yep. Um, they were beginning to get that that um, Frank Lloyd Wright influence. That's um, right. You see a lot of that and just lots of the, the detail. But we ended up with a much bigger city, a much you know, much smaller buildings overall. Yes. But uh, yeah, this was the first thing that they had. First thing that I saw really when I started the show. So uh, the this is one of, so this is where we started taking it. Uh, Matthew Talbot Kelly uh, is an artist here in Vancouver and I, I hired him. We had worked together many times and uh, he, ah, there was a shot in Stargate. I remember we looked at it last time where the helmet opened up. Yes. And uh, Matthew Talbot Kelly was the one who did that shot. But uh, he and I designed the city. And this was just one of our, our sort of sketches as we sort of started going down this. There was a, a, there was a snowflake book that the art department had. I don't remember who the author was, but you know, it became a lot of the, uh, it became the inspiration for a lot of the design work on the show. So we were looking at these different uh, things. Yeah, Bridget was talking about that influence. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you know, we're like designing. Yeah, we're just kind of taking the model and then rendering out interesting frames. And yeah. they would have been taking the model. We probably sent them our model and they would have started doing these these concept pieces with them. 
Wow. Look at that. Yep. Getting some Coruscant vibes. Yeah. Way before they had it. Yeah. I mean, where do you go with this stuff, right? There's only so many ways to go. That's it, you know? It's a futuristic yeah. looking city. That's right. It, you know, it's funny. Wow. It, it's funny because futuristic cities, they always imagine that they're futuristic cities without, you know, Blade Runner more than anything got it right. I You're going to so. keep building buildings, but 90% of what's here is from 100 and 200 years ago. Yep. So it's uh, it's the way it goes. And then there's the, the hive. The hive. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Built it was there so long, like the the mountainside grew on top of it. Yep. So that was a which, great idea. Which is really uh, thirty or forty years. There's a uh, during the Second World War there was the Empire flying. Uh, school where uh, Canada, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, they all started training pilots to send to England as fast as we could. Yeah. And there's one just a few miles from where I live. Uh, all the buildings are gone, but the roads are still there and it's all covered in trees. Yeah. So it happens fast. It happens fast. It's spectacular and you know they'll have pictures and you know here's a picture and here's the building and there's the hurricanes that were lined up of course we didn't get spitfires here because they were needed where you guys were right uh but uh yeah it, it's just fascinating how quickly nature takes it back and i'm sure the the wraith high ship is an organic ship so i'm sure that it's nature contributed to the Correct. the acceleration so yeah it's all it all makes sense so yeah underwater Yep, that was uh, that was pretty fun. Yeah, that we uh, talked with with Cooper and uh, I talked with Brad Wright about it at some point. Where it's like, you know, we'd love to see a window into <laughs> into the outer world at some point in this first season. But they had, I, but the time they got to the end of it, you know, getting ready for like the the Battle of Atlantis, like there were just some they couldn't afford to put a window in. You know, they they we just, actually had one window shot. Yeah, in the pilot. And, yeah, the uh, pilot. Yes. For That's sure. right. You see it, and then there's this explosion, and some bubbles come up. The yep. thing about the thing about visual effects is, for every shot, there's a look development that's attached to it. So you can say, "Oh, it's just one shot," but really, creating the look might be nine tenths of the budget. Yep. So at that point, you might as well put in four more shots <laughs> because we've done all the design work, and that's where the real money is. Jeez. And so that's one of the other things that I talk about when we're in production meetings, especially early ones. Uh, every new look, there's a cost as associated with it. And if you want to save money, you can't just cut one shot out of every one. You really want to cut one entire look, whether it's a location we go to or a window we're looking out of or something that we're flying around in, whatever it is to really affect the budget you got to cut one of those because it's it it in itself has a whole design process correct and that's takes time yeah. to get it right yeah the rising that's right so the sky is interesting because that's a picture that i shot and to this i think it was in san diego and we used it i think it's in the show oh it's totally in the show yeah once the city is on the surface, that wide shot, that looks exactly like that. Well, I'll tell you, because that was all very deliberate. When I designed the scene of the city rising, I, because this picture was sun over here, but blue over mm -hmm. there. And we deliberately started all the shots into the blue as if the sun hadn't come up yet. Mm. So that we started there. And as the scene progressed, the cam so the camera's always coming around. It's always moving. It's always circling. And by the end, we've got this beautiful sunrise shot. So that was very deliberate. That didn't happen by accident. Wow. And so that's San Diego sky. Yes. Wow. Probably. <laughs> Probably. My, I shoot a lot of skies. My, but my... There's, there's, one, there's one that I remember, and it was just beautiful. And that's the one we used here. My favorite shot from that whole sequence, you have a shot underwater. It's a view 
uh, it's like a first person perspective. Uh, someone might as well be standing on the top of one of the buildings, pointing a camera oh, up as it's breaking through the water. And yes. that is my favorite shot from that entire sequence because it's it's just wow. So this is one of the skies that we were kicking around. And I think what we did is we basically did a whole series of sky treatments. Then, you know, we went to Brad and Robert and said, you know, here's some different looks. Mm -hmm. And this is the one we like. But because this one didn't work as well for, for X number of reasons. So we probably use it somewhere else. Mm. Okay. But uh, yeah, that's the beginning of these shows. That's when they're really fun. Because you're spending all this time doing the design work and creating the look and getting them set up. Can you zoom in a little? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, man. Wow. Yeah, that's it. You know, that's 99% of the way there. Yeah, with, there's these big radiator fins that we had on three of the six mm -hmm. piers, we called them. There's the gaps in the piers. So the buildings, there was that recess. The building in the middle is taller. I think we ended up a little taller in the end. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of wow. That's kind of it. That's really spectacular. It was fun. So yeah, and shot of the pilot. That's right. So these were all just uh, sketches that we did early on, and then we sort of then assigned them to different places in the episode. That was a major feat, that, that two-hour pilot. Um, it sure was. I can't imagine how, the, how much that must have cost. Um, I know that, like, Star Trek was given anywhere, for some episodes, for three or four million dollars. I know in some cases, Atlantis had in the neighborhood of two and change. Yeah. Um, you know, that's not a lot of wiggle room in the scheme of things. No, we have to... Uh... You can't make a lot of mistakes. Yeah. You have to get to the art pretty quickly. Yeah. And I think because we all had worked together before, it was easier for us. Yeah. There's a shorthand that, that saves That's right. time and money. That's right. And headache. But uh, it's time is more time is more important than money. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Beautiful. These are just yes. sketches from the art department. Absolutely. Bridget's uh, Bridget's ship. Based on a, a shuttle in a loom. Yep. Yeah. yeah just genius. And uh, it's interesting because the one that we built, you know, uh, as always in the movie business, it's bigger on the inside. It's like a Japanese car. It's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. <laughs> You got to film inside of it. Yep. Wow. Very cool. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Yeah, just one of the... It's, it was just an elevation of of the technical sophistication of everything that had been built up. Oh, look at this. We've got... Um, yeah. Okay. I'm surprised I have some of this stuff. But this is Absolutely. pretty interesting. You can see they put it on wheels so they can move it around the soundstage. Yep. Right, all the practical considerations. Uh, it was cut in half, I think, as well, wasn't it? Doesn't yeah, it divide so it into two? Yep. Yeah. It had to get on a truck. It so. sure did, and I have some pictures of it on location shortly. <laughs> okay. Oh, so hey, John. This is picture we saw this is uh, that's an Airy thirty-five-three on its side. Uh, we were probably shooting waterfalling. Just this is me in the parking lot. I've got my Stargate hat. That's the Bridge Studios yep. in the background, and uh, I'm setting up the shot. Clearly enjoying what I'm doing that day. Does that say "fat bastard"? <laughs> it sure does. <laughs> so you shot water elements for the pilot? Yes. Wow. In fact, wait till you see some of the pictures. You'll go. I get it. I see what you did. Hello, Martin, Martin Wood, Wood. and yep. uh, there's a T1000 right there. Yep, <laughs> there sure is. And uh, me in the background. Okay. Look at that movie camera. Look how big it's they enormous. were. Enormous. Yeah. So this is an it, this is HD, right? Yeah, it's the lenses. 
Okay. You know, most people today shoot on primes, but okay. back in the old film days, we'd have these enormous zoom lenses because the cameras with a thousand foot mag were so big. Wow. The lens hardly like camera assistants were chosen because they had arms like tree trunks to carry these things around. Yeah. Yeah. They had to be able to, you know, handle it throughout the day and not need a chiropractor every other day. That's right. So for me, I, I could barely do it. I, and I'm, I'm six foot four. There's definitely been a change in the composition of the camera department now that we've gone digital. A lot more women in the department, a lot yeah. more people who are not enormous yeah. because lifting these huge cameras isn't a thing anymore. Right. Yeah. The technology the evolves. Now, this is in the Wraith. Uh, it's I don't remember the name of the set. It's like a it's like a dining room. That's it's, right. It's That's where right. it's where the keeper queen was. So th he's about to get his uh, his life sucked out of him. Yep. So interesting story, and I can't show you. I don't. I haven't found the quick time yet. The set was round. Yes. When they designed it, and I remember, I got the plans. I gave it to one of my 3D people. They built the set. I took the camera. I set it up. I remember that they wanted that long shot where it's somebody's POV. Yep. And I showed them, I said, we're not going to be able to get that set shot. But, and then I showed them a different previous where I stretched the set. And I said, if we can afford to make the set longer, it gives us a way better shot. So that was just a cool example of the visual effects department previsioning something and helping production out. Wow. Okay. So uh, that's, uh, that's what we did. Special effects. This was the Wraith planet after the ship, the Wraith ship crashed. And this was back before climate change, <laughs> where right. you could set off a fire in a forest like this and the city wouldn't just shut you down two seconds later. So this is not allowed anymore. No. So it's all digital now. You can, you would... We've done it on, uh, we did something like this last year, okay. but you, you know, you have to clean the forest out. So there's really no fuel and it, you have to be way, it's not that you have to be safer. We were safe back then too. It's just in Vancouver, when it rains, nothing can burn. Right. <laughs> it doesn't rain as much as it used to. So you just have to be much more aware. Of right. That. Well, ever since the whole baby gender reveal that everyone is you know, hyper vigilant about that now. Yeah. That's all there is to it. So, oh, wow. Look at that. There's the ship. Uh, Jeannie Pack. She's uh, very successful in the visual effects industry here in Vancouver. Is this one of those uh, color palettes that have to be kept in the dark at all times so it doesn't um, reduce it its... It fades uh, over time. Fades very quickly. So you close it up. The one that I have, do I have it? Mine's in, in this wooden box and it's, you know, it's got the Macbeth at the top and, and the chip charts at the bottom, you know, the, uh, wow. the, uh, the grayscales. Yep. But that's the standard test colors for, uh, for everything. We still use it today. Wow. So this was on the Wraith planet. Yep. And I remember during the production uh the tech scout we were just walking along and i said you know it would be really cool if it was a really windy planet they're like yeah 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 so they bring in all these fans on the shoot day and then it's like gidaki we can't hear any of the dialogue we're <laughs> gonna take money out of the effects department to pay for edr <laughs> like yeah okay my fault oh geez so yeah, here the ship is probably a little bit smaller because we only see the outside. Yeah. And then, of course, the set on the inside is much bigger because you need to get around. Look, you need you can fake it. You know. Absolutely. Look, if, if Star Trek's you know shuttlecraft can be like two thirds scale on the outside, you know you guys yep. can too. So, wow, that is so cool. And there it is. Nice paint job too. They did a, did a nice, good job. Nice patina edges uh -huh. look nice. The depth. Yeah, this is a cool looking ship. I like it. Absolutely. There you go. There's the fan. It's my fault. <laughs> and visual effects, taking notes. I think that's Martin Wood right there. That is. Yeah. You got Christopher Heyerdahl over there. Yep. So. Cool location. 
Now, I always loved, you know, at the beginning of every Stargate season, you know that all the locations, it was going to be very wintry and very cold. And as the season progressed, the <laughs> season would also progress. That's right. So, <laughs> that's funny. Well, there's a funny story that Hudson tells, Hudson Hickman. And, uh, you know, he explained it to me one day because we were just talking about writing emails, right? Mm -hmm. And he said that he learned a lesson on Stargate because uh, after the third episode, that had all taken place uh, in the forests around Vancouver. Mm -hmm. He wrote a little email to, uh, this would have been Stargate, probably Brad and Jonathan. Uh, he said, hey, can we not shoot in the rainforest planet anymore? <laughs> and, you know, that was the end of it. But the response he got taught him that what people read is, hey, can we not shoot in the rainforest planet anymore, you assholes? <laughs> and he said whenever he writes an email and i do this to this day mm -hmm. i put the words you assholes at the end of it and then i reread it go okay i gotta tone this down <laughs> <laughs> because of the way people are going to interpret it wow yeah i mean it's politics you know it and is people are going to hear what they're going to hear and we see this all the time in text messages you know people yes. freaking out over text messages and then later on it's like yeah, but he didn't mean it that way. Yeah. Ah, here we are. The first victim from the Wraith Queen. That was a nice sculpture. Wow, that's really cool. It was yeah. really well done. Yeah. That, look at that. Look at all the detail. What is that made of? Do you know? Uh, you know what? It's hard to say. It's probably a lot of leather in there. Okay. Yeah, leather is good because you know you can wet it and it shrinks. And uh -huh. uh, but de definitely a good sculptor did this. Who's the, who's this? Uh, is this Hamish? I, 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 yes. It says up there yes. in the top left, Hamish. So yeah, so he was yeah uh, he was with the effects department. Okay. And what did they say? An excess of personality. <laughs> okay. A uh, bit of an overbite on this uh, poor poor soul. Yeah. It's gone now. So. Wow, that's could have cool. been the uh, could have been the fire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was uh look at that. Jeez. Okay. It's funny how much work you do, and then sometimes you see it and sometimes you just don't. Right. So this is the uh the these are the wraiths. In tights? In tights. We these are some tests we did. This might be the actual footage we used for some of them. We gave them white and black streamers. We hit them with fans. We shot them on blue screen. And then you could lay them in, and the white and the black would allow you to distort them. Are these for when they were using their psionic abilities on the service to make people see things that aren't there? I think so, yeah. That's the element that's being shot. Wow. Yeah. Wraith in tights. Yeah, we hit them with huge fans to kick this stuff in, but you know, it never really worked exactly the way you want. So, and you know, you can see the camera is up on a couple of risers at the top of the dolly. We had them up on a platform so that we weren't shooting into the corner or the bottom of the green, of yeah. the blue screen. You can see the lights are across the bottom. And uh, yeah, we just filmed running left, running left, running fast, running slowly, close up, wide shot, diagonal. And then we uh, start for the first episodes, we would have shot some custom and then we would have shot a library that we wow. used to build back with. Yeah, this is one of the things that disappointed me about the show that we really didn't go further into. They did yeah. it a little bit, but not a lot. And, you know, you've got to you've you've got to start somewhere in terms of, of getting a, a library of, of shots in and figuring out what works and what doesn't. Yeah. And it could be that it just didn't work the way they imagined it, you know? Yeah, for sure. So that's uh, that's that. So that's me in my Arcteryx raincoat and hat. We and you can see there's something underwater. What is this? It's one of the piers. Really? You made a practical built, pier? You built a practical pier out of steel. I didn't know this. And then we lifted it out of the water because in those days the computing power to do all the water was just beyond our show's budget. So the particle effects could have been done, but they would have just blown your budget. 
We did a lot of particle one. effects for the close-ups. Okay. But for the distant shots, it was this element. Oh, wow. And then you just you guys just painted out the, the rig. Yeah. Painted out the rig. Wow, look at there's that. There's some more pictures. We'll come back to that one. But yeah, this is, uh, so there's the camera. The camera's under here. Look at the poor up. guy holding his face. Yeah. He ended up a face. And we, the blue screen's over here because it was a perfect sunny day. Okay. And we used the sky as a blue screen. In the summer in Vancouver, you get just perfect. In fact, today, it's, it's almost perfect. There's not wow. a cloud in the sky. It's just that perfect blue screen color. So you can just photograph it. Yeah. That's what we did. We had the the 20 by here, which we were going to use, but I, I want it to be wider. Yeah. And it would have forced the screen to be too close. And so the water, is, and then I, and then we're like, you know what? Move it out of the way. What happens if we move it out of the way? Hey, God's already provided you with the, the perfect palette. Nailed it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was, I mean, you know, it was just water. Oh, sure. Water, Absolutely. Water, water. Everywhere was water. That could have been for the shot of us, you know, kind of, exactly. of the city. Yeah, I'm going sure. through. Probably what we used it for. For almost every shot, we shot custom elements that we would lay in. So we had the CG of the city based on the previs, and then, boom, we dropped these elements in. Because the CG at the time could do the particles, but not these stringy things and not all the different sizes and not the right. highlights and shadows. So they focused on the city and they focused on that stuff. I made sure that we photographed all of these elements and we dropped it all into 2D. It's amazing how much work goes into just individual So this shots. is most of the crew. Wow. And I shot, I couldn't get everybody together. Because we worked days, we worked nights. Some people worked a little bit. So I said, okay, we're going in the bathroom. And I can, because I, I can control the lighting. It'll always be the same. So I set the camera up. There's Wes Sargent. And uh, Peter Hunt is in here somewhere. Some people I could only get by the doors. Uh, but yeah, it's basically. It's a great self-portrait. How many days, how, how long did it take to get everyone in there to get the shot? I probably spend about a week and you know, you're really cajoling people. It's like, we got to go to the bathroom. We got to shoot this picture. <laughs> I try and shoot a group picture on every show that I do. Uh... Cause you know, it's, it's a big team effort doing this shit. Couldn't get Jeannie in here. I'm seeing 16 people in this shot. That's a, yeah. that's quite the crowd. I met Wes. Wes was cool. Yeah. Wes so. is good. I, I can't remember his name. He was an up and coming 2D artist. We would, everybody would have gone home and he and I were left and we would just stay and work on these shots. He couldn't, you know, cause he, again, he's on his way to Star Wars, right? He was just getting started and he knew that if he put these hours in and he came up with his cool shots, it's going to, you know, for sure. It works for him. She worked with me at my company and then came over to Rainmaker. Okay. Uh, when I did this. Peter Hunt's not here. We went dog walking yesterday. He was one of the 3D guys. Uh, he did the, uh, I've got an example of it. The uh, high angle looking down, the elevator going down the ice shaft. Yes. Yeah. Yep. In yeah. Antarctica. Yep. Yes. So we had some concept work for that. It's clear what it had to be. And back in those days, we weren't allowed to turn on ray tracing. So ray tracing is a computational tool that tracks reflections off of objects. So if you're doing ice, you want everything to be super reflective. Mm -hmm. So we put a light way at the bottom. But the studio is like, you're not allowed to use ray tracing. We don't do ray tracing here. So we were, we were constantly trying to fake the reflections. And all it did was look like wet cement. Why so, don't they allow it? Well, because in those days, a it was thing? super, super intensive. Yeah. Okay. Now it's on a graphics card and it's basically real time. But back in the, in those days, it would take like all weekend to render something. So they wouldn't let us do it. Yeah. So one day me and I, this other guy, <laughs> we're like, okay, we're going to turn on ray tracing Friday night and we're not going to tell anybody and they can 
shit all over us on Monday, but the render will be done and it'll be beautiful. And that's exactly what we did. We, and it's just one of those examples where institutions lose focus, right? They'd rather, they would happily pay us for weeks to try and do this one way rather than pay us for a weekend to do it another way. Was that so for we, the shot of the, of the elevator descending? Yeah. The ray so tracing I, was turned on? Wow. Yeah. I got it somewhere. There it is. Oh, wow. That's what the ray tracing. Tra yeah, you can see it, the ice. It's like glass. Yes. It's and imagine the ice was wet cement instead. And that's uh, what it was looking okay. at. And it just wasn't working and it wasn't working. And then we got then we just turned it on and we kept that light and we let it go dark. And then we added that the little snow falling down. Yeah. And this was a beautiful shot. Opening shot forever. to the show. Yeah, going back to the head. But yeah, that was just a funny ray tracing story with this shot. We shot the actors overhead, and then we mapped them into the elevator, but they wow. barely moved. Um, yeah. Look cool. And also just the nice reflections on the, you know, on the structure. Yeah, the shadows. Yeah, it was, we did this on, like, we knew this was going to be a beautiful shot. You know, and we just kept it dark and just let the light ripple on everything. And that was, it was just so good. And this shot opened, over, uh, this shot rendered over the weekend. Yes. Okay. Do, were they only in, render, rendering individual shots over the weekend or were a lot of shots rendering over the weekend? We'd kick off <clears throat> big renders, but that okay. was, uh, here, let's see. I've got some more. This is my demo from like 2011 or something. There's Ayana so there we right go. There, yeah. This was the shot where the city left. Yep, sure was. And it was such a long. We 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 made a decision in Atlanta for Atlantis to make the shots really long, and it, at least at the beginning here uh, with this particular player. There we go. We just like the feeling of these really long shots rather than lots of quick cuts. It lets you take in the scope of, of the magnitude of, of the city. It know? really does. And the city was built to a really high standard. Yep. So it held up. But I remember seeing these spotlights on it thinking, where did those come from? Right. Something's left on the ground to generate that. Yeah. And I didn't... The guy who wrote it is a good, who lit it was a, a good friend of mine. And it was really near the end of the delivery. And this was almost the only chance we got. And he lit it with these spotlights. And I'm like, mm, not really what we talked about, but it looks kind of cool. Yeah, it does. So, and, and you know, you've got to reward people when they take their own initiative. Yeah. Because otherwise everything just gets stuck with you doing it. But Really nice shot. Yeah, Don't know if there's any that's more fair. in here. No, 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 no. Oh, there we go. Huge body of work, John. So, yeah, I found the previs for the space battle scene. Okay. So we can we can go there. Uh, you know, let's just uh, blast through some of the last pictures. Sure. And then... Uh, this is a different set of them. I'm going to go quickly and we can stop on what we want to stop on. Sure. Uh, so we saw that. So, oh, there, there you go. There you go, laddie. <laughs> what am I looking Boom. at? Boom. It's one of the piers. This is the pier that oh. we dropped into the water. Oh, is that? Okay. Is that up in the air? Up in the air. Okay. We suspended it from a construction crane. I mean, it's fun to be on shows where you say, okay, and I'm going to need a hundred foot construction crane and <laughs> we need to build a, and they're like, okay, because that's what you do. And, and of course, later in the season, that's not so much of an option, but for the pilot, you can definitely do that stuff. And in the background there, I think is the, um, uh, the glass uh, building. That, oh, what was its name? What was it called? 
In the show, yeah. it was the J.R. Reed Space Terminal, and it was used in tw- uh, 2010 and also in Bane. Uh, but it's now a casino. What is that building called? The Plaza yeah, of Nations. Yeah. Yeah. Plaza of Nations. That's it. You're right. You're really good at this. Thank you. Wow. Rachel, in her get up. Yep. Late at night. Yep. A little light in the sky, maybe. Stargate didn't Part- shoot very often at night. That was a pretty big deal no. when that happened. Ah, the night. drone. The drone. So, this is how we lit the drone to light it evenly to get CG textures. Okay, I wondered yeah, how you did that. There's everywhere, lights bouncing everywhere, the light is super soft, and we shoot the stills of it, and then we give those to the 3D artists. Okay. So that's what that is. Uh, there's the angle. Yeah. Pretty well from the camera that we're shooting it with. Yeah. We also, it looks like we shot it on a movie camera as, as well. Saw that one. Yeah. Oh, this was a test. A render test yeah. just of the city at night the uh layers you got you have these these layers uh, uh, yeah. yeah those went away as the show uh went along and the model changed yeah and i love this look because it, it makes it look like it was carved out of the ice and and the, the rock yeah. face but uh yeah that they, they just didn't they just didn't stay with that model they departed from it and it was really obvious to the naked eye so yep yeah. Wow, what was the the pouring thing? I think that's from an. What would that have been? Is it the some the wraith feeding on someone? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, the chest. Uh, it's, it's a vac form figure. Yeah. And we're pouring this goop on, and then we would have tracked it on. Yeah, I, I jumped over it, but. Interesting. Yeah, they didn't really have anything like that in the show. No. Maybe like Might have been idea. a test for something that ended up not being in. Yeah. Absolutely. The ship again. Yep. So that's, that's the so setup cool. for the pier. So we lifted it out, and it what we wanted it for was just the water rolling off the sides. Yeah. So did you just is this just a quarry that you went and filmed in? Yep. Wow. This was this is right across right there's the stadium. Yep. House of Nations is there. Uh, there's 50 million more buildings. Like this would have <laughs> been a building site. And I'm sure what happened is I told locations, I need a quarry about 100 feet long. And they this building was being constructed. And for all we knew, it was. Yeah, I don't know. You don't have to have. Quarry. Yeah, you don't have to drive very far, probably. It's it's in town. No, so. it's it's right around the corner from where I live. That's for sure. And you've got um, you got overcast sky. So your light is even. And yeah, yep. does the job. Hello. Hello. Hey, Martin. Martin, this is me giving them the budget. Ah. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, that set was cool. Yeah. There's me. Hey, John. Yeah. I'm yeah, so glad we, we've got better cameras now that don't have these this this blur yeah. to them if you don't have them perfectly lit. So so that is a mastage head from the feature film. That was uh, also in the pilot of Children of the Gods, yep. and yep. they were sure to bring that into the pilot for Atlantis. Yeah. Look at Andy's makeup. Wow. Yeah, it was really uh, distinctive. Oh for, oh, for sure. Wow, that's cool. Saw yeah. that one. Yeah. The map. I sold that. Really? At PropWorks, uh-huh. Yeah, this is um, this is hide-and-seek. Yes. Yeah, hey, Hewlett's going to go and throw the box into the gate. Yeah. Really cool. That Those effects, that was a really cool sequence with the, the chunks of, like, crystal floating around in the air, yeah. like the inside of the creature. That was a really cool idea. Oh, there's the... Oh, look again. at that! Look at the strips! Yeah. Okay. They definitely did use some of those elements in the pot. That looks... Yeah. It looks familiar now. Okay. See, we put some blue in there so uh-huh. that it would include the white and the black. And yep. it, it just wanted to look random, right? Yeah. It. Yeah, absolutely. And a little uh, time exposure running. Pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. How like often... We knew there... Go ahead. Sorry. Please. Well, I was just, 
we knew there was something cool in here. Yeah. But maybe we didn't capture it all, you know? How often uh, do you approach a situation like this where it's like, okay, we, we do want to get some extra stuff so that we can build some kind of a library for the future, you know? Every show, every show, anything that seems like it's going to repeat, okay. I try and bury in the pilot's budget okay. enough money to to build up elements that we're going to use. Because uh, on the pilot, the purse strings are relatively open. Okay. So structuring a show you try and, and and push as much into that as you can because it's more likely to get approved later in the season when you know they're into tighter patterns it's more yep no sorry yeah they have a they have a more specific their vision is more specific as to what they want that's true so, yeah that's true too there's that shot we saw that wild running this was the that's the rear projection for the um the the puddle. That's right. That's so cool. Look at that. There and look you at go. those two computers. Look at the horsepower. I think those are projectors. Oh, they're projectors. You're right, John. You're absolutely and right. It, the power we needed, one projector wasn't bright enough back in those days. Yeah. So we had to do them. Absolutely. The poor grips, putting the little wedges. You know, I'm probably on the other side going a little to the left. And I'm like, <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, almost there. The, the top corner is out of alignment. Yeah, you just got to make sure that the both of the projectors are, they're probably being fed the same frames Correct. at this at the same yeah. time. So, wow. Very cool. But it, it's the puddle. It, it had a little bit of, uh, it was a little forgiving. Oh, look at Andy. This is great. I've got to show this to her. She's going to, her mind's going to like, she's going to flip out. I found a lot of, because I've been digging up these pictures, people don't know that I have them. Yeah. I, I, uh, somebody contacted me through LinkedIn, and I just immediately sent them a picture back of them like 30 years ago. They're like, where did you get this? That, see, that's the thing. That's the thing that I love about, you know, things like this show. So in the foreground here is the, the gun over the shoulder, and yep. there's, the, there's the button on the front. You can see where the trigger finger yep. is. That's and then right. on the very it's front beautiful. is where it would yep. light. And yep. the visual effects people would go, oh, no. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's pretty fun. That's wild. Oh, that's my uh, wife and family. Ah. At the shoot. Uh, there we go. This is somebody else proud of their uh, proud of their work. Probably the DP. Uh, we would have had a, uh, I don't recognize this gentleman, so he mustn't have been in all the time. Mm. Uh, Dave, yeah. So he got mad at me one day. Oh, yeah? Yeah, and he was totally right. We were doing a scene, and I was standing in his eye line, which I shouldn't have done. You try not to do that. And he did something, and it was funny. And I started laughing and shaking, and it threw him off. And he came up to me, and he says, you can't stand in my eye line and then laugh at my jokes, you know? <laughs> oh, man. He was really good about it, but I totally was busted. Right. When we're filming, we always try and turn away so we never catch the actor's eyes. Yep. I did that once with Rachel. They weren't filming. They were in rehearsal. But yeah. uh, I I thought that she and I just had a brief moment and I got away with it. But but the That's publicist right. the publicist saw it and came over afterwards and, and she was like, Hey, just just so you know, you know, don't make yeah. don't make eye contact with them. So yeah. I was like, Oh, okay, that's fair. Yeah. Because Rachel smiled back at me, and I, I, it was, you know, I, it, I was like, oh, I, I felt good. But, I mean, at the same time, she's doing her job. Leave her alone. So, you know. Yep. So here's the wow. uh, command center. Yep. And uh, I guess we had to do a quick green screen. So sometimes we would just, instead of going to the green screen stage, we would just, you know, set something up. For sure. Set. Absolutely. But you can see how big. These sound stages were huge. Yes. I mean can't really see it but it goes up and up and up yep yeah big studio absolutely it was a it was an amazing space so there's the crane operator hamish again you get a sense for there you know how high we had the camera and then lifting up the uh, the pier let's see if we have uh i think it was playback i'm not sure jumping in for a quick uh cameo is that you oh so, yeah when we lowered it in, of course, the water would, you know, 
bubble like that, and then we'd have to lift it up. It was a pain painting out the cables, but it was I the would only suspect. way we could get it. Yeah, exactly. You're not going to have any kind of like apparatus that you can put under with it that will raise it out. So No, absolutely not. Oh, I guess I'm having a good day. Yeah. Don't know what this is, but... Uh, it's fra fragmenting of, of the, the picture yeah. data. Don't know why I have a hockey stick. <laughs> That's funny. Saw that. That's saw cool. That. Oh, oh there, there we go. Yeah. I sold those, and it was extremely cool. So That's the, funny. There were two of them. She was one of the artists okay. on the show. We would try and bring the artists on set. Yeah. Just so they could feel like, you know, they... So they're not just working on this stuff and don't know where it came from. Right. Or where yeah, what became of it. Yeah. Yeah. You can see how enormous these cameras are. That's wild. Yeah. They, they don't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Grow that big. <laughs> oh, so you, you just, yeah. You know, the cameras are smaller and, and you tend to go with prime lenses and you don't need all the shit on it. And then, yeah. Are the lenses getting smaller? uh lenses oh there you go there hey uh you know it's funny when we were on superman we shot anamorphic okay and what they did which i thought was really clever is they spent a year as they were in prep finding all of these old 1960s 1970s period lenses that had a very unique look and so we shot with these lenses exclusively. So we had no zoom lenses at all. Wow. And so on that show, yeah, it was a small camera, small lens. Off we'd go. Oh, yeah. So there's that thing we were pouring yeah. the coffee on. Yeah, uh-huh. Whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. There's the puddle jumper bay. Yep. That's right. We had that big establishing shot in there. Uh-huh. Doctor, this is why you brought me here. <laughs> well, there oh, you go. Look at that. So, so did you, that, were you pulling it out really fast and then shooting it at a fast frame yes. rate? Yeah, we're shooting as fast as we could, lifting okay. it up as fast as we could. Yeah. And, uh, you know, not only did we get the water, but we got those ripples coming off of it. Yep. And then we just lift it straight up. Is it a matter of just math, like in terms of of time passing? Okay, we, we have an idea. Okay, this building is going to be about this size, so we need it to be at about this speed coming out, and we need the cameras to be about this fast so that we get the right number of frames. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes and no. <clears throat> you generally always shoot as fast as you can. Okay. Because you can always slow it down, but it's really hard speeding it up. That's true. So... Uh, you can always slow down the camera. So, uh, so yeah, we we shoot as fast as we could. Okay. Uh, this is in the old VFX building, and uh, these were the previous artists. Is this at Bridge? Yes. Okay. So this is the team. Okay, got it. This, this is in house. In the back. Okay. Yep. Top floor, back corner. Okay. Wow. Yep. Wow. Here's the server on the ground. We would basically set this up and, uh, you know, it, it yeah. Uh, off we go. Do what you got to do. Yep. So yeah, there's that picture. Wow. There's, there's the team. And really, the, it's funny. Back in those days, right? Shelves with binders. <laughs> right. And our three inch laptops. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's just what was in my uh, camera bag. Wow. Back in those days, I don't think I carry any of this stuff anymore. Uh, yeah, so much of it's just not needed. You know, no, it's all well, part know, of a larger apparatus. Yeah. Well, also, I, I normally on the shows that I do now, I probably have a three or a four person on set team. Okay. So they carry all this stuff. Okay. Uh, it's me showing you how big it is. All right. This is in LA. Yes. Right at Hollywood and something, probably. Very cool. <laughs> yep.
Uh, don't know what we're shooting here. It's probably water. Oh, yeah. This was a gloss black surface, and we were pouring water down. We probably used it for water on the windows or yep. you know, something like that. Yep. And there's a window rig where we'd let the water overflow. Uh, this would have been a tank of some sort. I think it was a very narrow tank, about four inches deep. And we, again, we were just shooting different water elements. Yeah, I can, you know, almost see this as being a part of the rising. So, yeah, there's... I'm sure it was. Obviously, you just shot element after yes, element. We would have had a black behind it so that okay. obviously you don't see the the set and the, the, the weird roof of the bridge studios. Yeah. Yeah, so these are the artists. Eating while working. Eating while working. What's that? It looks like, a, it looks like a tower, yeah. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> Absolutely. And an enormous monitor. Yes. But How far we've come. Yeah, oh yes. So we were talking about the budget earlier, and one of the compromises that we made on Atlantis was we did all the effects at standard resolution and up res them. Oh. Instead of going HD. HD was just coming out, and we had the choice of going HD, but we knew that just the pipeline was going to eat about 15% of the budget. Just things move through the pipeline slower, renders happen slower, the artists sit around a little more. So we talked with Brad and we talked with Robert and we decided and we did some tests where we did the effects at HD and then blew them up to, or sorry, we did the test at HD and then we did some tests at SD and blew them up. And the blow ups were so convincing that we decided that let's put that extra 15% into new shots. Yeah. So save the horsepower for additional takes Correct. for additional shots. So, wow. Yes. I did not know that, John. That's, That's uh, wild. Yeah, we probably didn't tell many people about that. Well, by the end but, of the show's run, that was probably not the case anymore. No, no. So. Even a year or so, maybe even at the end of the first season. Okay. You know, the, the technology was changing so fast. Yep. But when confronted with the, you know, you can have 200 shots or you can have 230 shots. Or more. The story yeah. is better served with that's more true. shots. That's true. Absolutely. And that's sort of something because, you know, at the beginning of our call, we were talking about, you know, the logistics of production and things like that. And I said that I'm more into the art mm -hmm. than the tech. And I, I'm happy to go at a lower resolution and get more shots mm -hmm. than have the absolute highest technical quality, but really maybe not be able to support the story the way we should have. With our... Um... The TVs in all of our homes now, you wouldn't be able to pull that off so easily. No, not anymore. Yeah. You talked about animatics. Yeah. Let's have a look. So the animatic. Oh, no. Yes, you know where we're going with this. Oh, wrong one. Still cool though. Wow. Cool. Here it is. This is the this is what we planned versus what we shot. So it turned out to be a little different. They're on opposite sides. Okay. But, you know, we found a, we found a forest where they could run down the middle of a path. And uh, in this one, there's the two beats where the first one misses them and the second one gets them. But it gets forward show, too, yeah. Yeah. In the show, we got them the first time. Wow. It's crazy to see them like this. <laughs> it's, but it gets the job across or the idea across. Well, I'm always looking for something that's amusing. <laughs> <laughs> I think in part it makes people pay attention to yeah so that's that's that wow little Lego guys that is so that is so cool yep 
we'll look at the previs of this because I know we can't show the whole uh, the finished the finished episode. Yeah, exactly. It, yeah. There's no information for this online, so it's wow. I thought you'd like this. This it's is crazy. Isn't that, this cool? The dialogue. Wow, look at that. How much time is involved in creating something like this? The squid? A lot. Yeah. Lot. Are we talking weeks? No, months. 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 We'd be on this. We had one or two artists on this for months. And the gentleman who did the majority of the work, it, it was right up his alley. And he would bring in these, you know, World War II fighter books, uh, you know, history of second world war dog fights so a lot of the and i've got to tell you you know we would work on it i'd love to say that i controlled ev everything but yeah. i really did it was so good that we did this previs he laid it out we cut it together and i imagine when we went to show it to brad and robert they're like fuck done yeah you know? Because it's just so good. Yeah. No, he was really, really good. One of the, th one of one of the things about doing work like this is if you can plan it early. Because this is probably much bigger than they had in mind. It's pretty but, darn close. Well, shot it's for shot, very close to what's in the show. There's no doubt about it. But I think this is bigger than what they had in mind when we imagine the scene. But because we nailed it so early, if we can get it into production, Got it. It's, it becomes a machine in a lot of ways. So it turned out to be a really good scene. Yeah, there was never a, a puddle jumper dogfight sequence that was this um, dynamic really ever in the show again there was an asteroid sequence at the beginning yeah. of season four that was really really good and really cool but i mean this was this really set the bar you know well we had the time because it was the pilot yep you know so you can do a lot of stuff in the pilot that you can't do anywhere else like when i did the pilot for stargate again it was the same thing we just had a lot of a lot of time, a lot of money. Oh, SG1, a, yeah. A lot of support. Yeah, for sure. And it gives the, you know, the the effects people something just perfectly mapped because it's what's been approved. So. Oh, yeah. No, this was really good. But I've got to say the artist who worked on this was just super. And I think a lot of it for me was staying out of the way yeah just letting them yeah. do what they're good at once you find people who are really nailing it it's like it doesn't help for me to get in the middle right so you know and that's just something you learn as you go through life that you know you don't need the glory all the time right no exactly because people are going to give it to you anyway but uh thank you john that was really special that was really cool I can show you a little bit of the real scene, but uh, that's up to you. No, it's all good. We we know where it goes. The people who are watching this know exactly. Do you have anything of the previs of the rising itself? Of course. <laughs> but it's not organized like that. That's okay. I was trying to cut it together this morning, and I just ran out of time. That's no, okay. Uh, city rising. Oh, look at this. <laughs> Let's start here. You should be able to play them all simultaneously. Maybe. <laughs> they're wow. In an old, they're in an old codec. So I can't just click and play them. I've got to use an old viewer. That's the problem that I'm having. Now, this shot... <laughs> you can see the camera went right through right it. Right through it. Uh, we have a clipping we, issue. <laughs> so yeah we so what we did 
And what I like to do is I previs longer and then I give it to editorial. So the editors edit the scene and then they give it back to us and say, this is this is the approved cut. Yeah. And Bruce you know, would say that you would build handles into shots so that they could oh, move things is, around. This is, yeah, but this is like 10 seconds long, yeah. where it's probably three seconds in the show. Yep. So, you know, you kind of want to respect what they do for a living and give them, because when we're doing work like this, we can do versions really quickly. So we would have given them a close up and a wide shot and one from the side and one from the top. And then uh, they probably used them all. But, you know, and then we'll work on it. We'll budget it and say, yes, we can do this. Oh, we're going to have to lose two of these. Or do we keep these in and lose something from somewhere else in the show? I mean, mm. it sounds crazy, but those are the conversations that happen, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, this was this was always a good shot. Yeah. You know, and sometimes you do these shots and you just go, oh, yeah, this is this is great. Well, you can see it working even when it's, you know, looks like Stargate Atlantis Minecraft. So, oh yeah, you you know this is going to be good. You know, the, the, they can take this and get this over to the sound effects people and, and you know music right away. Yep. It's uh. Yeah, I can hear Joel playing. I can hear Joel's music as we're looking at it. So. Yeah. So this is, I think, yeah. So basically, wider and closer. Wow. Uh, Similar shot, move the camera over so we don't hit the building. Yeah, but it's breaking the water too. So Correct. And if you notice. The surface. Right. Yes, the balcony. the balcony. It's the balcony. For sure. Right at the top. We probably didn't have that there, and then it became a thing. It's like, okay, let's, let's put it in. <laughs> so, yeah. Another good shot. We ended up not, not using that one and going with the one before. So, you know, you can see there's a hint of the city underwater. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's, you've but, got it. Op yeah, it's not opaque. Yeah, it's those interactions when everything goes through. That's really what scared us the most. Those were amongst the hardest things where now, you know, you can run those simulations and you'll be fine. But back in those days, we probably, you know, we were shooting the thing lifting up, the pier lifting up, and I bet you we use those elements through, you know, in all kinds of places. Well, you've got so many things coming through, and it, the, not yes. only is the water interacting with them, but it's got to interact with the collisions from the other objects that are coming out. And you know, th there was a there was a similar uh, frustration that was made in the Stargate feature film where uh, James Spader goes up to the 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 gate and puts his hands on on the puddle and it makes it, these continual ripples. And the visual effects people were like, OK, you want us to hold that for how long? And it was yeah. seconds and seconds. And it's like, OK, the ripples are going to collide with other ripples and then make baby ripples of their own. And you, you, it's, they're like they were pulling their hair out. It's like the the yeah. longer they sustain that shot, the more complex it gets. So it was wild. Yeah. And in, in situations like that, you know, you go to the producers and you say, well, this is way harder than we thought. <laughs> right. And then it's the do you have more money or what do you want to lose to get it? Right. Yeah. Well, you can be upfront and honest. And it's like, OK, look, this is where we're at. You know, this is what yeah. we had in vision. This is where we're at. And obviously yeah. in, in a shot like this, it's not depicting all the particle effects from all the water that's running off of these buildings. That's right. Know? Which um, we'll see in a second. Yeah. But uh, for sure, this is, but you can see the, you can see the camera move, how the background is sliding from sort of night to day. Yeah. That was all very deliberate. And it was just such a pretty sky. It sure was. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. I remember that shot. Yep. At this point, the background's not moving, but you know the process would be something like after it got approved, we would then go in and and start the camera, you know, and make sure that all the shots go together. Of course. Yeah, it's yeah. not it's not many cities rising; it's one with many buildings. It's There we go. So basically the same shot, but we tilt it up so we don't see the water. Yes. Because 
probably what we would do is we'd go to Brad and say, you can have five of these for every one of those. Right. Cause the water, the collision with the water is just going to, it's going to take That's more rendering. Money. Yeah. So a couple of times we don't see the water and that yep. was deliberate just so we could increase the shot count and, you know, tell more of the story. Yep. But it's kind of interesting to see all the, all, all, you know, the compromises that we have to make when we see it on the day, it's like, Oh, that's spectacular. But then we, Correct. we go back and look at all the struggles. <laughs> and we're starting to see some particleization. Look at that. Early tests. Uh huh. Yeah, it was it, it was fun. I think we had one person on the particles the whole time. It was probably a horrible job, but you know, <laughs> I they got there. absolutely. I think this one, this next one, looks like that. If that frame is any indication, it's probably my yeah. my favorite shot. Oh, um, cool! I, that's look. my favorite. Yeah. Boom. How cool is that? You know, and it, it's funny, uh, Interstellar and everyone's made this, you know, the camera locked to the vehicle has become this this thing mm -hmm. now. But, you know, here we were doing it then. Absolutely right. Yeah. You're going for a ride. Yeah. Wow. Not to take anything away from Interstellar, which was spectacular. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know if this one was in the show. Yes, it was. was yeah, it? because the camera's rotating. I remember that. That 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 was definitely a shot where, yeah, the um the camera is it's it's having a bit of a pan effect because you can right. see that the buildings are twisting. It's in the really? show. Yeah, it's it's near the end. These are pretty much in order. That's cool. And so yeah, they, there's there were wider shots later on. Yeah, see there we go. There's the wider. Yep. Wow. Going down. Yep. I'm gonna have to look, go back and look at the. At this, the finished sequence myself, I'm curious to see if my mind I've is playing tricks on me. I've got part of it in one of my demos. Yeah. So I can bring that up. Yeah, it's not there to go outside on the and look over the balcony. Yeah. Scene 105, if I recall. Oh. That's yep. right, the big wide shot. The wave dissipating. So this is version eight of the shot. Wow. So this shot wasn't in initially. Okay. And I just said to Brad, you know, it would be super cool to just cut really big and wide and yep. see that ring coming out. Yep. It's now arrived. Yeah. So this was a sort of a last minute, not a last minute, but... Not part of the original. Okay. Design. And I've got that one as a full res quick time. I, I can show you some of those. Okay. Because there's some. Uh... Oh, what's this? It's one of the. Oh, that's right. There's yeah, a side it's like shot. the second shot. Yeah. Yes. Of it's right after the first one, looking down with the yeah. with the city rising. So very and cool. Towards us. Yeah, that was yep. a good shot. Just spectacular. This is just yeah. this is just amazing to 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 see. So well it kind of shows you that once the once the previs was done, then you're really you're fighting to make it look real. But a lot, you know, the art and the timing and everything, it's basically there. It's locked in the previs. Let's yeah. see. Is it here? Ah, okay. Yep. There's your shot. Yeah. Yeah, right. There it is. And then I just went to this because yes. this is my demo. But yep. uh, what's 
what's interesting about that last shot, and I'll see if if it picks up. Uh, this is from Slither. Uh, oh, okay. There we go. We one thing we struggled with with the underwater shots is banding, where the colors are uh, the colors are so close together that you see. And so we had to break it up. We put more green in the water because then you're using blue and green pixels, which helps reduce the blending. And we use a lot of noise, which also helps break it up. If you see the water here, there's these these shapes where it's lighter and darker and lighter and darker. Uh huh. That those weren't in there initially. And we looked at the shots like, well, that looks cool. And I, I think it got approved. But I, I said, you know. Something doesn't feel right. And I had flown to Salt Spring Island, one of the local islands here. And I had a picture of the ocean, of the, you know, essentially the ocean. And it had these regions. And I don't know if it's different temperatures of water or what it is. I think it's wind. It, it could be wind. But when we put these in, you don't really notice them. But it just makes it feel more yep. like water. Yeah, it you you grasp the the scale yeah. of of uh, the shot. The ships are at crazy angles. In other words, we had them lined up, and it just looked boring. Right, so I started bringing them really close, and then we needed to angle them up and angle them down. So you know, this guy down here is probably pointing way more down than he than he should be, and this one is pointing way further over. But it works within the shot. Correct. You need to, it's it's not about their attack strategy. It's about the composition of the image. That's right, and that's something that uh, you also get sort of from some artists. You get pushback on where they're like, "Well, that's not it's not right." Ah, uh, well, what's right is you know not always what's right. <laughs> so. Ah, the takeoff. Yep. Yep. After we've uh, woken up the hive. Yeah. And they are upset. Good shot. Yeah. It was initially going to be a sunny day. And we decided that the hive planet would always be overcast and angry. And I think that was a good call. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And they go back to it in uh, 38 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Well done. It was a fun show. It was a good group of people. And it was just a fun show to work on. I can only imagine. That's the shot where the dart arrives on Athos. I think, it, I think this one is going away. Let's have a look. Oh, yeah. They're leaving. Look at that. Boom. Yeah. The C uh, CG gate. Yeah, definitely. The gate itself. No, maybe it's a CG gate. Yeah, it must be a They CG never gate. made a location gate for Atlantis. And it was they, they made a, a third of one. Right. Um, but it, that was later used. But it always, you know, like uh, burnt me because the the show is called Stargate Atlantis. But you never have um, the gate in a lot of these background shots when they're on location because they didn't manufacture one. They just had the one on site or uh, in the in the gate room. And, you know, the, one of the, th the things that I loved about SG-1 was. The gate was in the background, out of focus, in a lot of shots. So its presence was always felt. And in yes. Atlantis, you just didn't have that. Yeah, you're right, because they spent, it, you'd have to spend money to put it in there. That's right, exactly. It'd take a day to install and a day to take away. Yeah. Wow. Well, there you go. So that's that, how we imagined it. It was uh, supposed to be built. A lot tighter. Yeah. It was... It was a horrible day. It was raining cats and dogs. It was a horrible day. And nobody wanted to be here because this was like the last shot. Okay. So you're there all day long and they're just, uh, there's no hill. Well, shoot it here. Yeah. But it's, and they lit sort of the field. I think there was a hill, but it was way over there and, at the end of the time, you know, it's just, no, we're going to shoot it here. You're putting the gate in anyway, right? Yep, yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> it gets the job done. At, you know, it, it worked. It it does. The audience doesn't know, except now, of course, they know. But uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's just one of those things.
demo. Oh, look, it's my fish. So here's just lots of individual shots. Yeah, these are finished. We, yeah, we didn't really talk about the helicopter. I had some good previews for the helicopter, but it, it wasn't that big a moment. You showed uh, us those in the previous one. We did. Mm -hmm. We did. Oh, and here's the gate firing up. So, um, oh, and then was, the tilt were the, the glyphs a visual effect or were those practical? So that right there, is that... Um, and then it sure looks like it's practical, doesn't it? Because it, it fades and they become like what they were before. So I'm curious. I'm trying to remember if they if the the glyphs were visual effects when it was going around like that. Um, I think that they I think that they were practically done. I think that I the think LEDs were, were programmed. They look like LEDs. It looks like somebody programmed them. Yeah. You know, it's not spinning like it did in the in the movie. Right. Uh, it is what it is. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, I'm pretty sure they're practical. Very cool. And that's uh, you see the gate, of course, is not round because the image hasn't been stretched to sixteen by nine. Did you guys we, render them this way? Yeah, we rendered them. I, yeah, we rendered them this way, and then we stretched them at the last minute. Why? Budge, uh, budget? Faster. Yeah. Okay. Wow. I never knew that. Yeah, 16 by 9 was the distribution format. But it, it, it's funny because in, in Stargate, you know, everything was 16 by 9. But most of the episodes aired 4 by 3. And you just don't have the 16 by 9 versions out there. Yeah. And so they they, they take the 4 by 3 from the 16 by 9 and remove information from the other, either side. Um. There you go. Here's that. Uh... Oh. Yeah, see, it's four by three. It's funny, you know, this is the, the height of our abilities at the time. But uh, it it would be so much better if we could do it now. But well, it of is, course, you know... woulda, shoulda, coulda, you know? I mean, you guys did yourselves proud with what you no. had then to work with. Yeah. Absolutely. I... Puddle jumper takeoff. That's probably the uh... what we just saw from the uh, yeah. animatic. Yep, there oh, it is. Okay. Yeah, we there saw either. I think we saw West Sergeant working on it <laughs> in, the, yes, in a yeah. photo. Yes, you're right. Yeah, because it's and... transitioned from a from a model that's on the ground to a digital effect. So yeah, probably just paint out the model. Yep. Wow. It's nice to have it there for real because it gives you the lighting and the position and the focal length and everything. Correct. Yeah. And most of these we would have seen. Yep. The gate. And, oh, here we go. I think this is the window. There it is. Oh, there you go. And boom. Yeah. It always drove us crazy because he points before it happens. <laughs> Well, what can you do, you know? You, you can't. It is it is what it is. We've got his little reflection in there. Uh-huh. That, that's a water element. These bubbles would have been an element that we shot somewhere. Man, so much work goes into something just as simple as that, you know? Yep. It's pr provided you... Provided you plan it out, everything goes smoothly, everything's going to be great. I could just open these all day long. I know. <laughs> Two, right? Oh, the balcony. Yeah. This was a re this this shot was really hard. The lens was so wide that it didn't matter. Nobody could agree on what angle those piers should be down there. Yep. They don't look right, but everything else we did looked even worse. And I don't think it really bumps for anybody. I think it works. But, I think it. I think. I think it gets the job done. Yeah, so. could have had a better sky. Could have, should have, would have. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Look at all, all this. Right. The the like uh, the Star Trek uh, feature films you know, with the Enterprise E in particular, and they're in the uh, the uh, observation lounge. They're and they're having their briefing. And it's like you, you guys, your your nacelles are gone. 
you know yes the, the, where's the ship's warp engines you know it's just not a fat it's just not a consideration so yep but well done very cool well there you go okay bring me back to you or bring you back to me or yeah that was spectacular um <laughs> you know there's so much work that goes into uh uh, developing just one hour, or well, in this case, like with the Atlanta pilot, two hours of television. Um, but, you know, there's, it's just, at the end result has got to be, you know, so rewarding for you to look back and oh, see yeah. that you know, we pulled, we pulled this off. We didn't have, I mean, we had the budget that we had, which I'm sure was, was actually pretty good for, you know, for good, a pilot. Sure. And um, you guys, you guys pulled it off and did yourselves proud. So. Well, you know, and it's not just that, of course, the people and some of these people become your friends. Yesterday, right. I went for a dog walk with somebody who, who with the guy who did the the uh, the ice shaft. So, right. you know, even 20, 25 years later, we still keep in touch. Right. You've you've built uh, long lasting relationships and uh, and the work is just an extension of of that. So it's uh, yeah. it's a privilege for me to have you guys on to. Uh, to discuss these uh, these stories and, and share them with a, a broader community who is still finding the show and uh, and falling in love with the the characters and and all the elements that bring it together. So thank yeah. you. Absolutely, John Gadetsky, visual effects supervisor. I always enjoy sitting down with John and picking his brain. He's a wonderful guy. He has uh, so many insights to provide about the industry and just so many cool things to look at. So John really appreciate you coming back, uh, for, for this episode, uh, October, we're going to be wrapping up season three of dial the gate. So keep it on dial the gate.com to see the complete list of all the shows as they're developing. Some guests have had to drop off. A couple are coming uh, on. So, uh, dial the gate.com is where it's going to be at my thanks to my production team, Linda gate, Gabber fury, my moderators, Tracy, Anthony, summer, Jeremy Reese, you guys make the show possible week after week. And big thanks to Frederick Marku at Concepts Web. He's my web developer that keeps uh, dialthegate.com up and running. That's what we've got for you. Keep it on uh, our channel as we continue to stream more content uh, for the rest of the month. And uh, then I'm going to take a much needed break. But until then, we've got a few more episodes to do. My name is David Reed for Dial the Gate, and I'll see you on the other side.